Tell me about too many snakes. I'm mm -hmm. curious. Uh, so that was the first game I decided to like take seriously. Uh, you know, I had done game jams and stuff before then. I um, kind of played around with game development, but I was like, okay, I'm going to actually take a game from conception to production and to uh, release. Um, so I wanted to pick something that was smaller, you know, for my first project. So I was like, okay, I'll concentrate on mobile. This was about six, seven years ago. Um, so mobile market was smaller than it is now, but it was still pretty big. Like the, you know, it, there was already a ton of competition. Um, so, you what know, year I, was it again? Sorry. I, I, um, like 20, I think I released in either 2014 or 2015 or something. Maybe okay. 20. Yeah. So I like started working on it in like 2013 or something. Um, yeah, something like that. Um, so I, I wanted to make something that was, you know, relatively straightforward. So I was like, okay, I need to find a game concept that's pretty easy to implement. And I can just like lock it down and get it out the door. So I came up with the, this idea of, I, I really, I still really enjoy puzzle games. So I don't know if you've ever played the game Rush Hour. Uh, it's like a physical uh, puzzle game where you like have these little cars that you slide around and you try and just, like get the one red car out. Uh, I have not. I don't know, Gary, have you? Uh, I've seen the movie, but no, no. One. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it's a, I took this uh, kind of game I enjoy, this, this board game, and had a twist on it, which was rather than cars that just slide back and forth, I had snakes that you could twist and bend around the map and you try and get this mouse out. Um, and it was, uh, it was cool. I really, you know, dug into it and it allowed me to make a lot of different types of puzzles and things like that. Um, but even that simple concept ended up taking much longer than I expected. Uh, one of the big issues was uh, finding the minimum number of moves uh, to get the mouse out. Um, because it was one of these games where it's like, uh, you know, you try and it's not timed, but you're just trying to get the mouse out in as few moves as possible. So move a stake once and again, and then th three times get the mouse out, you know, that kind of thing. And then you get like a rating at the end, like how close to the optimal, uh, you know, solution did you get? Um, but I found that, you know, staring at these puzzles, I wasn't sure I was getting the optimal solution or could figure them out. So I eventually made this whole uh, kind of automated solver system that it's, it was just like a brute force, brute force method. It, it would just like play my levels, just like try every single move until it found like the minimum moves to get the, the guy out. And it ended up like actually taking some serious computer power. I had to like get uh, Amazon EC2 instance with a- Really? <laughs> memory because it was keeping all these different games in memory so like the biggest memory load that could happen uh and it's just like even though the games i could like write the game state in a very small way it was like maybe uh you know maybe 10 bytes or something um or maybe a little more than that but anyway it was even with that, that small state, which keeping track of all these states of the game, I was blowing through the memory of these giant computers. Um, so it ended up like taking a while to not only like, program that so it could run on these big machines in the cloud and then like find these optimal solutions. Uh, and so yeah, even, even simple concepts can easily, uh, you know, go out the window. Interesting. I, um, I don't, yeah, I definitely didn't want to do that. I, did, I didn't put that kind of effort in Burgle's Bounty. I think the optimal solution was based off of what I thought it was because <laughs> I designed the level. But uh, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, for me, I, I like, it's almost like, uh, I felt almost like a challenge to myself. Like I, I need to see like 
what is the optimal solution to these puzzles. And like, I felt like the, t the computer was almost teaching me something. Like I was like, I was seeing like, oh, I think this is the way to do it. But maybe the computer could tell me this, can teach me something about my own game, uh, which was really interesting. Yeah, and how much did you learn? Uh, I learned to never make a puzzle game again. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that is, work. Um, that is uh, yeah, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to make another puzzle game, Blair? No, 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 Ho hopefully not. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> or at least, at least not one that, like, one thing I was going for with the game is just like this purity, like the rules were very simple. And you just, you could only do a few actions. You could just twist these snakes around and move the mouse. And so like, I was wanting to like, you know, you know, I'm still fascinated by games like Go, which have pretty simple rules, but have a lot of complexity and how that, those rules work with each other. So I really wanted to, you know, make something like that, that had these like easy to learn rules, but like uh, really hard to master concepts. And uh, I somewhat succeeded in that. And that is, that is something I actually still strive for with Kung Fu Kickball. You know, that, that's like a, almost like a core ethos of, of whale food games is the uh, easy, easy to understand, but- Hard to master. Hard to master, that's right. Very nice. All right, next question is for both of you. Um, so what's your like workflow like when you're creating game slash music and what keeps you motivated? John, or it's actually John, do you want to go first? Uh, amphetamines. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Um, that's that's the motivation part. What was the other part? Uh, what's your workflow like? Um, okay. Um, let's see. Um, so I, I guess at, I'm I'm trying to think about the game. Like, I guess the first part of the workflow is like trying to decide on a vision um so that can be like um what is what does the whole soundtrack sound like what do individual parts of the soundtrack sound like i'm trying to sh like i don't know figure where out where the soundtrack should belong in like all these axes of what music can be i don't know that's really abstract um so like um right now i'm working on a game called shillelagh and it's um let's see what am i trying to do right now um i guess i figured so game developers i don't know sometimes they have an idea of what they want sometimes they don't either one's fine um and uh I guess, yeah, I really start trying to figure out the vision based on what they tell me. So maybe they have like a specific genre they want. Maybe it's just like a, a mood. Maybe these like obligations or like, it's, it's like, what does the soundtrack owe to other people? So like, if you're writing a battle theme in a JRPG, you know that you can, you know, you owe Uematsu some money. Like the soundtrack owes like a debt to that guy. So like, you know, okay, I can pull anything from Uematsu's work and that'll be appropriate here because um, it's just like you're, you're playing into the history of, of the situation, you know? Um, and it can also be you know, I, and I guess I just kind of just like cross reference as many things like that as I can think of. It's like, so like in Shillelagh, we know we, we started off thinking like, okay, you know what, actually, let me talk about kickball. This is about kickball. Um, I, I can't remember anything from more than like 20 minutes ago. That's what <laughs> I was thinking about that. Um, anyway, um, what? so I'm trying to think of what we started off with 
I, I, I actually, I honestly don't remember. What's your it's workflow probably... like? How, when Jonah tells okay. you I need X, Y, and Z, uh, how does that yeah. all work? So, let's see. I think where I started with kickball. So I don't remember, and maybe Jonah, maybe you remember some kind of prompt or like requirements that you laid out. I, I don't remember. I think I left it pretty open ended. I was yeah. pretty much like, here's the level art. You know, make some, yeah, yeah. It's this level art. Because yeah, so I was I was going off that a lot. Um, so like, um, who was the artist by the way? Uh, Juno, Juno Men Mendiola, I think it's Juno. Shout out to Juno. Yeah, um, yeah. Wonderful artist, wonderful work. Um, I really loved getting to, um, you know, bounce off of that for this. Um, it was super fun. Um, yeah, it could be like, I, I looked at Juno's art and I just see stuff in that. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, um, the Caves song. Yeah, that was I the think, first one. Yeah, that was the first one that he did. And that was the first one that I bounced off of. And I remember just kind of taking inspiration from like the giant statue that Juno drew. Um, uh, so like, <clears throat> sorry, um, that can be like a starting point. Um, I also knew, so like Kung Fu Kickball, um, you can think of the game as kind of like a Smash Brothers game, at least just in like the structure, like, you got some characters, you know, it's, it's a fighting game and there's sports. It's like both of those. Um, and I think it, you know, in, in my world, it's, it's a smash brothers like game, like, cause that game is my life. Um, so, uh, I, from there, I, I understand like, Oh yeah, here's like the title theme. Here's like the character select screen. Here's the levels okay so that this is like that that kind of gives me like a meta structure to the whole soundtrack um one that i'm familiar with so then from there i don't know i can take any idea from any of the smash games um i couldn't just this is kind of just how i think of it is like let me just steal from anything that i can justify to myself as a like a reference or a progenitor um and and in the end i just try and like go back and cover all my tracks so like maybe it just doesn't sound too much like that. But um, that just gives me an excuse to like engage with that music. So like um, uh, kickball, oh, it's called Kung Fu Kickball. Obviously like we're going with the Kung Fu theme here. I'm a big fan of Kung Fu movies. So like from there I can go, I can just like take any of the ideas from like any of those old Jackie Chan movies like i can take like that like what's that <laughs> like rush hour <laughs> yeah no see exactly <laughs> like you can just get that idea for free and i feel like just because it's in it's that's like on the map of like the of our culture like if you draw the connection there then i feel like your audience is going to pick up on that and say like oh okay this makes sense like they're not going to be like hey why did you put that flute there that doesn't make any sense um they're, they're going to be like oh he's referencing uh the flute from the soundtrack to drunken master and he gets to do that because it's also kung fu or something i don't know um so yeah i get i just like try and figure out how all of those things got made like all that music um so i'll from there i'll try and figure out like how i can make those sounds myself so like in this case um i don't know i'll, I'll piece together oh okay i i need a like 70s vintage p bass for that like funky kung fu movie soundtrack sound or something um and then i'll just go get that like um and like play the bass and try and figure out oh like what's how do they phrase their shit um how do we get to this to sound like it really came from that and that that actually takes a lot longer than i would like i guess or a lot longer than is like um 
we are really viable from a production standpoint. I take forever. Um, so, and I feel like it's, it's cause it's like most of my process is this kind of research and like digestion of stuff that I can steal from. Um, so from there, you know, I guess it's time to actually write the thing. Like I've talked, I don't know, like eight minutes right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm just starting to talk about like actually writing music. Um, yeah, from there, like, I like to get sheet music for everything that I can think of, like anything I can justify and study it and figure out like, oh, like what's the harmonic language that they use? What kind of, I don't know, like what what makes this kind of music work? And let me figure out like um, how to get that, like how to, how to take that and like making it into something that I can use. So um, that m- might be like uh, kickball, um, the desert theme. Um, half of that song is just System of a Down, just like kind of played like pretty shitty, to be honest. Um, but that's what that song is. So that's like, for me, that's an excuse. Oh, okay, I can spend a week just like learning System of a Down riffs or whatever. Um, and... I'll practice that and I'll I feel like it's important to like get that stuff under your fingers because um I don't know I feel like my fingers are smarter than me you know they'll take it um I like uh, honestly something I learned on the last soundtrack I did was like learn a bunch of songs and then it's like say one of the songs it's got like an A section B section C section um, like learn all those and then I don't know just like write a D section and that's like your B section of a, of an original song like um, that's like a really easy way to kind of like turn someone else's music into your own but like still like cover it up um, so eventually I kind of figure out like what are the limits of what I can actually play um, and that kind of dictates yeah that gives that gives me like some parameters um so i guess i got i guess i'm like thinking of it as this kind of like problem solving thing and i know it doesn't have to be that way and i think i'm gonna move out of that someday but um for now that's what i can do basically how's that compare to you gary uh you know they a lot of similarities. I uh, I also do like to, like to do a, a lot of kind of research I- into stuff, but it's more like I have. Um, so what I I have a subscription to uh, East West uh, Quantum Leap or whatever. Uh, so what that is, it's a it's yeah. a scr- subscription yeah. service to uh, I guess a lot of uh, virtual instruments that I use um, to kind of do sounds for uh, for MIDI. And I still have a lot to do in terms of like going through it all and actually trying to find what sounds I do have and listen to them all. Right. Um, yeah. Cause they've got so much stuff. They, yeah. They got a lot of stuff and you know, I, I spent a lot of time downloading stuff, but I don't necessarily kind of go through and figure out what I have. I mostly kind of um, go through a, a process where like, Hey, you know what I have in my head an idea of what I want to do and I just sit down and go, but I find myself continually losing momentum because I have to, okay, now, like I want a flute sound or I want something that sounds like whistle. Right. Then I have to kind of like sift through all these libraries to try to find it. And I can usually never really find something exactly how I want it to sound. So I just kind of make do with something that's similar. Right. Yeah. And then, and and then I, yeah. And then I go and tell Blair, you know what, this sounds like shit. Uh, (laughs) I want, I want, I want to revisit revisit this later. Man, yeah, I, I get it, man. Like, I feel like sample libraries, you know, they can sound awesome, but I also feel like it's it's a real challenge to make something that sounds like music with them. Like, yeah, um, I feel like games are actually a really like they're in this unique place with that right now, mm-hmm. where it's like because of um, you know, you had these games that were coming out where it would be like kind of sequenced in real time for like cartridge space or whatever. Um, 
uh so you wouldn't have like a wave file of the whole song you would just have like samples of all the instruments and and you know like your nintendo 64 would play them or whatever um i feel like um the generations that, that play these systems kind of picked up on that and so now we have this um it's it's like hypothetical music to us it's like here's this this thing that you're hearing is kind of an abstraction of another piece of music that like was played with real violins or whatever but mm -hmm. like um but it's it's like the limitations of that medium um got um this is dead air um anyway You're fine <laughs> okay yeah i i, I think like <laughs> How, how I would look at it is like the, the limitations of the medium actually um, kind of gave gave that music its its own character. Yeah, of course. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I yeah. find that like, uh, you know, if you play a game and it legit was, let's say, recorded by an orchestra, then, you know, it still sounds good. But, you know, I, I find that sometimes because of that, the music fades too much in the background that I don't notice it. Okay. You know, whereas, uh, you know, if I'm playing a game that was made, you know, in the 80s and 90s, um, you know, the music was such a big part of that game. Like, it wasn't an afterthought. Right. Is that yeah. it was just as, it was just as important as, let's say, the graphics. Is, is it fair yeah. to say that, um, that musicians who work on, like, games today, AAA titles, don't have to deal with the same limitations of the technology we did 20 to 30 years ago, and instead of creating chip tunes, they could actually create movie quality or or studio recorded quality music. Stu, no yeah. limitations, but the uh, the caveat is that now, uh, you know, your the the de demand, uh, I guess, for quality is so much so much bigger. Well, I, I think it really depends on the title because there's a lot of indie titles, especially that are looking for a specific sound uh, to, to make it sound like it came from that era right like so a yeah. lot of chip nintendo style chips tune mu chip tune music seems yeah. to be in demand today yeah but for triple a you know there's also you know sure like triple a now can have this whole range of music and have whole orchestras and things like that but then i think there's also this pressure to go further right with this like adaptive soundtracks that like change depending on your environment and things like that so it's almost like uh you know, it's, it's this whole other thing of like, you know, the technology is like pushing music in these weird ways as well. Yeah. Adaptive isn't that new. Like RPGs have been doing it since, since the nineties, like, like Fantasy Star 3, I, I'm a Sega, I'm a Sega fanboy, would actually change the battle theme music based on how well you were doing in combat. Cool. And like Skies of Arcadia on the Dreamcast did the same thing. Um, but I mean, I guess, it's not, I, I, okay, I digress. I mean, no, well, it's true. The, the concept's been around for a while, but just like in terms of the demands of like how subtly it switches from one to the other and, you know, how, how, how many levels of, you know. How energy. good the transition is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and uh, I find that that would probably be harder to do, let's say if you're actually recording um, off uh, a live stream versus, you know, programming music, which is what mostly I do. All right. Cool. Um, well, I'm going to actually pivot over to Jonah's turn. Jonah's turn to answer this question now. Oh, yeah, I get him. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jonah, what's your workflow like and how do you stay motivated? Uh, all right. Workflow and how I stay motivated. Um, I guess I'll tackle the workflow first since I don't have a real answer for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, my workflow can change a lot depending on what I'm working on. Um, you know, one thing about being uh, like a basically one person uh, game company is that I kind of switch off what I'm working on from day to day. Uh, you know, I think probably some of the most fun workflow, which I, is actually a smaller part of game development than people might think, is playing the game and adjusting things and then playing it again. So like, 
tweaking the controls. You know, I think that could be, in a, in a sense, the most fun because that's, you know, you're actually feeling the, uh, you know, the changes you're doing. So you make a change, like, oh, maybe I'll make this guy kick a little stronger. And it reminds you, you when you're playing the game, sorry, that, that, that it, your game's actually fun, right? <laughs> At least that's what it does exactly. for me. Yeah, right. So like, like gameplay programming, like that, that's kind of a more fun workflow. Um, and especially, you know, you know, definitely during the beginning of Computer Ball when I was trying to get the jump to feel really good and like deciding like, okay, how high do the characters jump? How floaty are these physics? You know, because I did want it to feel a little bit like uh, like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, where there's like characters kind of like soaring through the air. Um, so I wanted it to feel like a little bit floaty, but not too much and stuff. So so that kind of tweaking and playing and going back and forth, and then and and then and so, and so you think you have it right, and then you like put it in front of people and see how they react to it. So that's definitely the most fun fun aspect of workflow. Um, but then of course you know. With, with my game, I had to have online play and I needed AI. So there was tons of work that went into like getting it to work online. And uh, that's not as fun because it's just like, play the game, did it break? Yes, where did it break? Okay, fix that, play again. Oh, now it broke somewhere else. Okay, go back, fix that. Okay, play again. And that repeat for six months, you know, <laughs> so, um, not not That's quite fun. Yeah, right. Um, even like the so the AI training was was cool. Like it finally got it to work. So I used machine learning to to train the AI of my game. But getting that to work was like okay, it's not learning. Why isn't it learning? Tweak some parameters. Try it again. Leave it for overnight. Okay, it's learning a little better. Maybe try something else. You know. So just a little, game development is all about iteration. Uh, but some of the iteration is more fun than other iteration. <laughs> um, but then, uh, yeah, that's the workflow. The other part of the question, motivation. Uh, motivation is also tough. Um, I feel like the best thing you can do for motivation is just like try and get, a, get something, just a little something done every day. Just, it can be small. Just make sure you're, every day you're putting in a little bit of work. Um, and even, you know, and just accept the fact that some days are gonna be, you're gonna get, get less done than other days and be okay with that. Um, as long as you're like doing a little bit, those little bits add up, no matter how small they are. Um, so it's just like reminding myself of that fact and like, you know, also taking it to conventions can help a lot with motivation, you know, the one of the reasons Even I, when the feedback is bad <laughs> that can be harder um but like this game in specific i made to do well at conventions <laughs> yeah um, Local multiplayer does well at conventions yes. um that doesn't mean anything about game. skills necessarily yeah. Yeah. uh but to it this kind of game because people go to conventions to like play games with their friends so any yeah. kind of game they can sit down and play against or with their friends they're gonna latch on to. Um, and I kind of noticed this, uh, you know, seeing my friend Sam's game, Zarbot, being shown. I was like, oh, I wanna, I wanna experience that to see like people like whooping and hollering about my game. So, so I made a game to specifically cause that reaction. And then when it does, it feels really good. Um, so that can also be very motivating to to like just see that feedback. So that, that's one of my favorite things to do with the game. So I'll take it to convention. I got it set up so it like teaches you how to play it on its own. So I don't even like interact with it at all. I just stand back, watch people come up, play, have fun. They don't even know that I'm like the developer there. They just like go play the game, have fun, leave. I just, I just watch them, watch them have fun. <laughs> that's awesome because I remember um, seeing Kung Fu Kickball at at even both Megfests that I went to. And I remember that, you know, you, it was on an arcade setup and there was like a whole group around and like whenever someone would win, you know, they cheer. It kind of reminds me of the old kind of Street Fighter days when I would kind of compete against other people at the arcade and against friends and stuff. So I'm glad, uh, glad you're able to see that, uh, that experience kind of come to fruition, fruition. Yeah, thanks. And not to go off on a side tangent, but because you brought up arcades, 
you know, that's another great thing that has come from uh, the game is that, um, the, you know, I, there's another group here in New York called Death by Audio Arcade who make indie arcade cabinets and they found my game and were like, hey, we think your game would work cool in a cabinet. And, it, and that's actually another like thing I had in mind when I originally created the game. It's like, oh, wow. Like I, I knew about Death by Audio Arcades. So I was like, wow, it would be really cool if it was in a cabinet. And the fact that they, they, like, they came to me and they're like, hey, we want to put this in the cabinet. And I was like, hell yeah. So, uh, so oh, they awesome. were able to, uh, to build this cabinet and then like bring it to MAGFest and stuff. So that's just been another kind of sort of dream, dream come true with this game is to like see it in an arcade cabinet. And, you know, we actually just shipped out the second cabinet. So I heard, congratulations. Thank you. Funny story, some random arcade bar owner from Beacon, New York, like must have seen the game at Wonderville, which is the, the bar run by Death Body or Arcade uh, that, that has the game currently. And he's like, he thought it was like a, a product. So he reached out to me. He's like, hey, I'd like to buy a cabinet. Like, oh, cool. We don't really sell we'll them. Build one for you. We'll build one, right? <laughs> so, so I worked with Death Audio again to to make a second cabinet, and that like just went up to to Beacon. It's this bar called uh, Happy Valley Arcade. Uh, wow. And it's like just yeah, just went up over the weekend. So well, that's been great. And, you that's know, awesome. Oh, that's got to give you all the feels. <laughs> it, it does. It does, and it also makes me think like you know, from a business standpoint, it's like okay, well. Maybe the key doesn't market here on Steam doesn't do that well on console. Maybe I'll try and sell cabinets. It's a completely different ecosystem. You know, there's actually not that much competition in the the indie game cabinet market. There, there aren't that many uh, customers. You know I don't know. I know. I know. Uh, scene. I mean, I, I don't know what the demand is like there anymore. Sorry, go ahead, Gary. Go ahead. I'm saying like I know a couple bar owners up here. I might yeah. be able to convince them to get one. That'd be great. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> So up across the border. Yeah, why not? Um, so it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how it does in Beacon. So I'm, I'm keeping track of like, this is also the first cabinet that actually has accepts uh, quarters. So I'm going to see how much it actually makes for that bar. And like, if it's doing well, I can be like, hey, buy a cabinet. It'll make back its cost in this many months and things like that. So it's definitely another. Actually, how many, uh, how many months do you think it would take to make back the... Uh... It's tough to say. So the cabinets cost about uh, five grand to, to create. So they're not cheap. Um, now, how I decided to do payments is you, it's like a quarter per player. So if you're doing a four player game, that's gonna cost a dollar. If you're doing 1v1, it's just 50 cents. Um, so I would be, I'd be pleasantly surprised if it makes back its money in like four months. Uh, I would expect, I'm actually not that optimistic about how long it's going to take. So it would, I would guess more, maybe like a year and a half. Uh, if this bar is like continuing having people come in. Um, it's like what, what I'm finding a uh, special here in, in Edmonton is that there, there's, a, there's been a lot of bars popping up here that like are arcade themed. Interesting. And are, uh, they're doing, they're doing very well, so. Nice. Well, that's the other thing is like, even if it's not necessarily making money with the quarters that go in, a lot of these arcade bars actually don't even care about the money they make on the games. It's all about the drinks. So if it keeps exactly, people yeah. there and buying drinks, which where bars make most of their money, then that can also, that can be a great selling point too. Um, and it has an interesting part in this, this market because like, in terms of indie arcade games, right now the biggest one is probably uh, Killer Queen, uh, which is actually another local company here in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, great guys, Nick and Josh. Um, but then there's not that many other like, but Killer, Killer Queen kind of requires like almost 10 people to play. You know, you can play with less, but the best games are with 10 people. So this could be like a slightly smaller version. Of that game Killer does Queen, seem kind so. of intimidating whenever I see it. It's like, ah, oh, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> It, it's a lot. I, it's, it's great, though. It's got a huge community. Like, people are really invested in the game, which is really cool. Um, but it's also, like, kind of this uh, forerunner to, like, show, like, yes, the indie arcade games can be a thing. Um, so I got a lot of respect. Yeah, that is kind of cool. Yeah. Nice. Very nice.
Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, please consider liking and subscribing. If you'd like to support the creation of our content, both podcasts and video games, please consider joining our Patreon. The link is in the description below. Please find all the links for Kung Fu Kickball and the social media information for Jonah and John also in the description below. And finally, please stick around for Kung Fu Kickball's character selection music. Wow.